Hey, this is John Orberg, and we're looking at passages to wisdom, great thoughts from great minds. And today, as we're going through this letter, this book called Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, I want to talk to you about joy, joy and sorrow, why joy is our strength, ask uh, you to reflect on what's the level of joy in your life from day to day, and invite you to make this a day of joy. You may notice behind me is a statue of one of the most revered characters in the history of the church, St. Francis of Assisi, he's holding on to a little bird because he famously loved creation. Among other things, he, he is the patron saint of care for the creation. And he literally would sometimes preach the gospel to birds because he loved them so much and he believed all of creation needs to hear the gospel. And the gospel, after all, is good news. One time in the Old Testament, there's a occasion when the people had rediscovered the scriptures, the law of God's will for human life. And they realized, as we often do, if you listen carefully, you'll hear a bird joining in now. Uh, there he is. Hey, learn the gospel, bird. Uh, they realized, as we all do, that they had fallen so far short of being the kind of people that God wanted them to be. And so they were grieving and weeping. And there is a season for grieving and weeping. There is a place for it in our lives. But Nehemiah's comment to them was, not today, not right now. Uh, eat food that you love to eat. Celebrate and rejoice because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Two really fascinating aspects of that statement. One is that joy is strength. Sorrow is a very important part of life. And I'm in a season where uh, the presence of sorrow is an important dimension of life. Every day uh, I work with a therapist who has me do a daily mood log and I'll look at um, sadness, a sense of inadequacy, loneliness, guilt, where are, are all of those things, anger, resentment, and then happiness and exuberance. And part of what I'm aware of right now is that I want to invite joy in my life, but it's not unmixed joy because there is concern and care for uh, people in my life that means that there's also a burden to this life. And actually, it's very helpful to me that the Apostle Paul says when he's writing to the church at Corinth, one of the ways that he describes himself is um, sorrowing and that's an ongoing, regular experience of sorrow, grief over suffering that's taking place, and yet constantly rejoicing. Those two are not opposed to each other. They can actually coexist. However, Nehemiah says joy is our strength. Joy is strength in a way that sorrow is not. Joy produces energy and expectation and hope. Joy, Dallas Willard used to say, is a pervasive sense of well-being. And so it provides a kind of nourishment for us. And that's why it's so, so important to practice joy, to be a joyful person. And then Nehemiah says, it's not just joy that does this, joy of the Lord. What is joy of the Lord? And the idea is not that it's uh, restricted to something that I experience when I'm at a church service, when I'm thinking about something religious, because a lot of times that doesn't help a whole lot. Joy is a pervasive sense of well-being, and of course, it is ultimately God who provides this pervasive sense of well-being, because with God, all is well, all is well, all manner of things are well. So the joy of the Lord, the one who makes my life set on solid ground, who watches over me, who cares for me, who does not slumber or sleep, he is the source of joy, even in the midst of sorrows. Now, people who try to follow God have often been quite confused about joy. Sometimes we think of holiness as this very somber thing, so it seems as though joy, laughter, lightness of heart are opposed to the kind of righteousness God calls us to. And then on the other hand, we live in a culture where the pursuit of happiness is taken to be so central that often people are ashamed to admit that they're not happy. We idolize happy. And the road to happiness does not lead through idolizing it. It always comes as a byproduct, as uh, the, the overflow of pursuing something else, something deeper, something more meaningful. So 
here's words from old Uncle Screwtape to Wormwood about joy and spiritual life. He's writing about how the patient of Wormwood, the human being, has made friends with people who are quite worldly, quite uh, apart from following Jesus. Steady, consistent scoffers, whirlings, who without any spectacular crimes, he writes, are progressing quietly and comfortably towards our fathers, the devil's house. You speak of their being great laughers. I trust this does not mean that you're under the impression that laughter as such is always in our favor. In other words, that it leads people away from God. The point is worth some attention. I divide the causes of human laughter into joy, fun, the joke proper, and flippancy. And by the way, people who write and speak about joy are almost never joyful people. There's nothing that kills humor faster than analyzing it. Uh, Nancy mentioned one of the ways that uh, we were drawn to each other initially was we both love this very funny writer named Robert Benchley, and he would write hilarious articles about experts who write articles about humor and just kill it. But this is quite joyful. You will see the first, uh, that is joy, among friends and lovers reunited on the eve of a holiday. Among adults, some pretext in the way of jokes is usually provided, but the facility with which the smallest witticisms produce laughter at such a time shows they are not the real cause. And by the way, I was just reading yesterday research, one of the guys who's kind of the primary scientist of laughter, who notes that uh, the very young laugh up to 300 times a day and with adults at something like 15, somehow we lose the capacity for laugh, notes that researchers have been quite surprised that when people generally laugh, it's not really because something funny got said. It's not because a hilarious joke got told. It's an expression of some sense of joy that's inside of us that needs only the slightest occasion to come out. And this is what he writes about. Uh, what the real cause is, we do not know. Something like it is expressed in much of that detestable art which the humans call music. And something like it occurs in heaven. A meaningless acceleration in the rhythm of celestial experience quite opaque to us. Joy is the product of heaven. The joy of the Lord, among other things, means the joy that God himself experiences and that we will one day know in unadulterated form. Old Screwtape says, Laughter of this kind does us no good and should always be discouraged. Besides, the phenomenon is of itself disgusting and a direct insult to the realism, dignity, and austerity of hell. Fun is closely related to joy, a sort of emotional froth arising from the play instinct. It is very little use to us. It can sometimes be used, of course, to divert humans from something else which the enemy would like them to be feeling or doing. But in itself, it has wholly undesirable tendencies. It promotes charity, courage, contentment, and many other evils. Fun is a very good thing. Joy is a very good thing. And to invite it into your day is a very good thing. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in this day. Screwtape talks about two other forms that are related to laughter. Uh, one of them is the joke. And a very interesting observation here. He says, uh, body humor is of little use to hell, to tempting people away from God. Often people can be deeply devoted to God and their sense of humor can be quite body. And I'm thinking of some of you right now whose names I shall not name, but you know who you are. Um, where joke is a more powerful force for evil, Screwtape writes, is that often people learn that we can joke about very serious vices or problems. I might be an ungenerous person, but if I turn it into a joke, I might be a cruel person, but if I turn it into a joke, how often in relationships do we say things like, I was only joking, can't you take a joke? And we cover meanness of spirit with a veneer of humor, and then we're walking down a very dangerous path. And then this is so interesting, but flippancy is the best of all. Uh, if prolonged, the habit of flippancy builds up around a person the finest arbor plating against the enemy that I know. 
and it is quite free from the dangers inherent in the other sources of laughter. To be glib, to be flip about what matters, about the nature of good and evil, about hell itself is a danger to the soul because it causes me to forget what is at stake in human life and in the pursuit of goodness and in loving people. So we don't pursue being flip, we don't pursue being glib, we don't pursue that kind of cynical, sarcastic attitude that is often mistaken for humor. We live in sorrow over the grief and troubles of our lives in this world because Jesus was the man of sorrow. But he's also the man who said to his friends and says to you right now, I have said these things to you so that my joy might be in you. How would you like to have Jesus' joy in you and your joy might be complete? Running out your ears. May you know that joy today. May I know that joy today. May our joy be complete today. May the joy of the Lord be our strength today. I'll talk to you tomorrow.